Hey there folks, Andrew Swan here, and today I'm going to show you two things. The first is how to potentially work around issues relating to DVD rips you've made using MakeMKV, and then I'm going to use that process to show you an alternate method of transcoding DVDs into video files suitable for editing without using MakeMKV. This is meant to be sort of an update video to my previous tutorial about how to use Make MKV to transcode DVDs into editable video files using AVI Synth, FFmpeg, AVSP Mod, and QTGMC. You can check out that video, but uh, realize that I have switched over to AVI Synth Plus in the meantime, so please take that into account when watching it. Other than that, the rest of the tutorial is perfectly good, so I'll put that up in the recommended videos right about now. This is a tutorial for Windows. In theory, it could work on other operating systems, but some of the programs involved are Windows specific, so keep that in mind. Before I go any further, I should also mention that there are easier ways to transcode DVDs if you're in a hurry. Using Handbrake is always an option, although you will need to set up a particular file in your Handbrake program directory in order for it to decrypt copy protected DVDs. The other downside to using Handbrake is that it only exports to relatively low quality video settings. However, it's a method that's used by professional video editors from time to time because in general it just works. You could also try hooking up a DVD player to the input of a real-time conversion box like the Terranex, then connect the output of the Terranex to a video encoder device or capture card, but this may not work if the DVD you're trying to convert is copy protected. Speaking of which, I need to stress that if you're working with copy protected DVDs, you need to follow the laws of your country or the country of the production you're working on. I make sure to have explicit written permission of the copyright owner before using copy protected content, but I am not a lawyer. If you're in any doubt, please consult a real lawyer with experience in the copyright law you'll be dealing with. I should also mention that I take no responsibility for any harm that comes to you or your system as a result of using any programs I tell you to download and use today. I virus scan everything before loading it onto my system and run through the workflows to make sure they work. But it's always possible that something malicious could sneak past a virus scanner or some unforeseen catastrophe could happen. Basically, you follow this tutorial at your own risk. If you can't accept that, please stop watching now. One other thing before I get started. I have a blog. Mesolatthefront.blogspot.com I post text versions of my tutorials there that include direct web links and additional info. I'll have a corresponding blog post for this tutorial up there, and that'll be linked to in the video description down below. If you haven't already installed the 32-bit versions of AVI Synth Plus, FFmpeg, or AVSP mod, there will be links to my other tutorials on how to do that on the blog post. Alternatively, you can also try my tutorial for installing both the 32-bit and 64-bit versions of everything on the same system at the same time. I'll put video versions of those tutorials in the recommended videos right about now, so you can check them out. Oh, and if for whatever reason you want to skip over the Make MKV workaround and go straight to the alternate DVD workflow portion of this tutorial, then there will be a link down in the video description notes that you can click on to go straight there. All right, with all that out of the way, why don't we get started? So, first of all, let's go ahead and go down to a folder with some MKV rips here. All right, so if I roll through these briefly, uh, this is a 24 frames per second DVD, yeah, so warm in there with and this is a roughly 30 frames per second DVD. Advanced hundred, and there were some adults that were. Yep, and then there's this one. 
This is an interlaced uh, DVD running at 29.97 frames per second. And if you just play it back kind of normally, it looks okay. However, when you take that MKV file and bring it into AVI synth, uh, as I'm about to show here, and then do a deinterlace on it, what you end up with is the following. It's fine for a sec, and then you'll see some twitching. <laughs> now, normally I wouldn't put too much stock into this because FFmpeg source in AVI synth uh, is kind of flaky when it comes to motion sometimes, uh, especially if you like roll back and roll forward in a preview. And it usually doesn't show up in the end result. However, in this case, if I go to the resulting file that I would render out normally, take a close look. Okay, see that the twitching is definitely present. And it looks nasty. Okay. So at first, I figured that this was a field order mismatch or something like that. But as it turns out, it's not. <laughs> and uh, there isn't really much of anything you can do from within AVI Synth or FFmpeg to correct this issue either. It's something to do with the way that the MKV file is constructed and FFmpeg source or FFmpeg uh, just kind of freaks out at it. But in this particular case, I did find a workaround. And let me show you how I did it. The first thing we're going to need is a program called MKV Extract, which is part of the MKV Toolnix suite of tools for dealing with MKV video files. MKV Toolnix includes stuff for basically breaking apart, putting back together, and messing around with the metadata of MKV files. Uh, to grab MKV Toolnix, you'll want to go to mkvtoolnix.download slash downloads.html and just go ahead and click on the Windows link. You want to go to the download link, which at the moment points to FOSS Hub and you'll then get a list of all the different options for installing MKV Toolnix. Uh, normally, I would probably go with the portable version, but for today, there's actually a reason why I would prefer using the installer version, uh, and that's because it makes the next thing that I'm going to download easier to work with. So I'm going to recommend the 64-bit Windows installer. This next thing is a third-party graphical user interface for MKV Extract that's called GMKV Extract GUI. <laughs> and normally I don't recommend wrapper programs because uh, if the developer decides to discontinue working on it at some point, then uh, you're kind of out of luck. But in this case, it makes the process so much easier that I'm actually going to recommend this, and it's also a wrapper that's recommended by the MKV Toolnix project itself. So I feel a little more comfortable doing that than just some random wrapper that somebody's put together in a weekend. All right, you can just go to sourceforge.net slash projects slash GMKV Extract GUI, and you'll be able to download it from there. When that's done, uh, go over to the AVI Synth wiki, which is at avisynth.nl, and just go ahead on down to the external filters link. And we're going to grab something under source filters here. And this is DGD code. DGD code is part of the DGMPEG deck package, uh, which is 
at this point a fairly long in the tooth but still effective uh, program for indexing and demuxing DVD video files. We're going to need to use this in order to do kind of an alternate way into loading the video and audio data into AVI synth. Uh, so if you go there and grab the DGmpeg DEC 158 underscore SSE package, that should be fine. There, as far as I know, is not a massive speed difference between the two different versions, but uh, the SSE version is newer. So, all right. And then there's Nick Audio. And what Nick Audio does is it allows you to load up the audio tracks that are from a DVD natively into AVI synth. As part of the process that we're going to be doing here, we're going to be splitting the audio and video streams into separate files. Uh, the video files are handled by DG Decode. The audio files are handled by Nick Audio. You can also transcode audio files using FFmpeg into like a WAV file and that will work equally well. I'll maybe show you that a little bit later into the tutorial if you want to do that. All right, so I'll go ahead and grab that as well. And when you're done with that, go ahead and go to VirusTotal or use your antivirus program of choice and scan everything that you have just downloaded. Okay, and as you may have noticed here, there's one detection on this file. This is kind of an issue specific to VirusTotal. If you get a detection from your antivirus program of choice, then behave with extreme caution. But VirusTotal includes a number of different antivirus solutions that have a really high false positive rate. So if you see one to two detections but not detections from most of the major antivirus programs like Symantec, Kaspersky, Bitdefender, etc., uh, then maybe consider the possibility that it's a false positive. Uh, as I said, I take no responsibility if you get a virus from stuff, but this is just the method that I follow. Uh, in particular, Silence, Rising, and Zhangmian, or Zhangmian, I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce it, are all programs that have a higher than average rate of false positives. So if those are the only virus engines that detect something, and especially if it's something generic like this unsafe warning, then in my opinion, it's usually a false positive. But again, proceed at your own risk. All right, once you've done that, go ahead and go to your downloads directory and let's begin installing some stuff. First thing up is MKV Toolnix. Pretty simple since it's an installer. Just double click on it. You'll notice that I've turned off the secure desktop. That's just because it interferes with my screen recording software. But if you do not see a grayed out screen behind this prompt, be very, very suspicious. All right. All right, so we'll just hit OK. Next. The default options here are perfectly fine. And as you will notice, if you need a GUI for MKV Extract, then the first option on the list here is GMKV Extract GUI, which is what we will install next. GMKV Extract GUI. If you can't open this file for some reason, you probably don't have 7-zip installed. You can grab that from www.7-zip.org. And as you can see, there's only three files in here and uh, no directory. So you should either create a directory where you want to put this or uh, just do the right-click menu and use 7-zip to extract to a directory that's the same name as the archive, uh, which is what I'm going to do. So um, you can put this directory pretty much anywhere you want on your system. 
It's uh, GMKV extract GUI is not tied to a specific directory or anything like that. I literally have a folder on my desktop called miscellaneous AV tools that I use to put all this stuff into. Um, as I said, you can put it in your user directory or program files or something like that. All right, and once you've moved that over, go into the directory for GMKV Extract GUI, double click on it, and make sure you don't get any errors here. Uh, it should automatically pick up on the directory where you've installed MKV Toolnix. All right. Okay. I'm going to do essentially the same thing with DG MPEG deck, since that does not have an installer either. So you just open up the archive, and this one does have a folder already in it, so you can just drag that folder to wherever you want, and that should do it. Then to set up the AVI synth plugins, you'll need to go to wherever your AVI synth install is. Uh, I use the universal AVI synth installer. So I actually have this AVI Synth repository folder with a bunch of different versions of AVI Synth. Uh, the one thing is you will have to use the 32-bit version of AVI Synth or AVI Synth Plus, since that is what DGMPEG deck uh, uses. All right, so wherever it is, go into the plugins directory. In AVI Synth Plus, it can also be the plugins plus directory. Either one will work. What you will want is actually just the DG Decode DLL from the DG MPEG deck archive. All right. Go ahead and open up Nick Audio and open up the folder inside and copy over the Nick Audio.dll file. And now you should have everything set up and ready to go. All right, so let's go back to our MKV directory. What we're going to do is we're going to open up GMKV Extract GUI. And we're going to take our MKV file, drag it into this input files window here, and then check the stuff we want to extract which in this case will be track one and two, video and audio. If you have multiple audio tracks, then you might want to select those as well. All right, uh, then for the output, you can either use this browse button down here to determine the output directory, or just if you want to extract it into the same directory as your file, just click on this use source checkbox. And either way, once you figure that out, go ahead and click the Extract button. And it will go ahead and extract the audio and video files. All right, so what we now have here are this .mpg file, and then we've got this .ac3 file. Uh, if the DVD rip that you're using has DTS or PCM audio or something like that, then you'll have a different extension uh, and you'll have a different type of audio file here. As it is right now, the MPG file won't really work for importing into AVI synth. Like it won't be any different than the MKV file we were using before. So if we look at this alternate workflow here, you'll see that what we're going to be doing is bringing in the video data, the audio data, and combining them together. But you'll notice that uh, the video data uses this strange .d2v extension. And that is a project file that you save out of DGMPEG deck. So that's what we're going to open up next. And specifically, we're going to be using a program called DG Index. So 
If you open up DG index, then click on file and open and go to your directory with your video file in it. Uh, and then hit open and OK. You should now be able to just kind of scrub through this whole thing and you should be able to see the entire video uh, playback through there. OK. All right. So um, just to double check and make sure everything's working, a good thing to do is to hit the F5 key and that will do a quick video preview. And when you want to stop that, you can just hit escape but you know, let it run for a few seconds or so. And what this will tell you are a couple of settings that are good to know uh, before going forward. Things obviously like your frame size and aspect ratio are important, but also the frame rate, uh, the video type, whether this is NTSC or PAL, and the frame type, which will generally tell you if it's interlaced or not. But it will also tell you the field order of any interlaced video. There are some DVDs that kind of mess around with this, but in general, if you have it just straight up interlaced DVD, this is pretty accurate. All right. So when you're finished with the preview, go ahead and just go over to File, Save Project, and just go ahead and save this project file. Again, I would just say in the same directory as your video file. And you'll notice that the playback bar goes ahead and runs through the entire video. What DG Index is doing right now is generating a so-called index file uh, that has kind of a record of all of the frame data that is used as kind of like a instruction set for DGD code to load up the DVD files in AVI synth. Okay, so we can go ahead and close that. And now let's take a look at our new AVI Sense script here. So as you can see, um, we're setting up QTGMC to deinterlace and doing the usual things. Uh, we noticed that this was bottom field first, so we're doing an assume BFF in here. And just for the heck of it, I'm doing the QTGMC command with FPS divisor equals two to reduce the frame rate down to 29.97 frames per second progressive. Uh, but if you want to leave it at 59.94 frames per second progressive, then you can just remove this or set FPS divisor to one. All right. So you'll notice here that we've set a couple of variables here. One is called video, one is called audio. Now, technically you can name these pretty much whatever you want, as long as they're, I think, using non-special characters. Uh, but just for ease of use, I like to do video equals, and then the uh, video input command, which in this case will be mpeg2 source, and then the name of your DG index project file in quotes inside parentheses. Uh, then we're going to use for audio Nick AC3 source. And again, if you're working with DTS audio, you do Nick DTS source. If it's PCM audio, it's Nick LPCM source, etc. And you put the name of your audio file in quotes inside parentheses. And then we're going to use this command called audio dub. And in audio dub, in parentheses, we'll put the name of both of these variables with a comma and a space separating them. So in this case, it'll be video, comma, audio. And if we hit F5, we'll bring up a preview window here. And if I start moving forward through this with the arrow keys, you'll see no twitching. Looks perfectly fine. All right. So go ahead and save that, close it, and then you can run this script through FFmpeg and the result will look something like this. So 
again, keep paying attention to the wings here. Yep. Nice and smooth. So cool. Um, that's a pretty interesting little workflow, right? Well, as it turns out, you can use a variant of this process to bypass make MKV entirely with one real significant caveat. And that's if you're working with a copy protected DVD, you'll need to find another program to remove that copy protection. And this is where we get into some dicey legal areas here because technically removing copy protection is a violation of copyright law in many countries. Uh, in the United States, we have something called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act that uh, regulates this. Most of the programs that remove copy protection from DVDs have had either lawsuits leveled at them or have gone into bankruptcy. A number of the free options out there are either really outdated or are ad supported, <laughs> which is a big red flag to me. Uh, some of them will only work like handbrake in the sense they'll only transcode to consumer video formats. And the one program that still kind of stays up to date and seems relatively reliable is actually a driver that goes between your DVD drive and Windows. And it's gone through lawsuits, bankruptcy, and moving to several different countries in order to stay in business. So uh, all I can say is I'm not going to make a recommendation here other than to be very, very careful if you want to go down that route. However, if you're working with an unencrypted DVD, this process is considerably easier. Basically, all you have to do is put your unencrypted DVD in your DVD drive, open it up, and you should see a video underscore TS folder. Now, uh, if you go into that folder, you'll see a list of all of these different files. There's BUP files and IFO files and VOB files, otherwise known as VOB files. All we're going to be interested in here are the VOB files. And specifically, we're going to want to find all of the VOB files in a particular title that contains the program that you want to extract from your DVD. Uh, if you've got Video Land Client installed, this is pretty easy to do on an unencrypted DVD. Basically, just kind of double click on any of the VOB files and you should be able to see what they are. Like in this case, this is the menu animation that I have for the DVD. Uh, whereas if I try playing back this, I can see that this is the actual program I'm looking for. Now, you may have noticed that VOB files are divided into these different parts. So you'll have all the VOB files of a particular title will be within this two-digit number. It'll be VTS underscore 01, 02, 03, etc. And then you'll have a single-digit number after that. And that single-digit number uh, describes the part number of the VOB files in a title. So in this case, you'll see that I have one, two, three. Uh, these can go much higher than that, depending on the length of the program, the quality of the compression, etc. But basically, periodically, uh, because of the way the DVD spec is written, titles will be broken up into additional VOB files. And you want to grab all of the VOB files for a particular title except for the one that's got this underscore zero. That you do not need. But every VOB file with underscore one on is the one that you'll want to grab. So in this case, because we're doing the title number one here, uh, we'll just select all of those and we can copy them over. 
So um, I have actually already done that because the process of copying over files from a DVD sometimes takes a little bit of time. But I have all of these arranged in a folder here. Now, this DVD that I'm working on, I should mention, is not a standard format for most DVDs. It actually was rendered out at 29.97 progressive frames per second. Now, all DVD video is technically played back, interlaced, but in this case, because both fields contain the same information, it's as if this DVD is a 29.97 frames per second progressive DVD. So we don't need to do deinterlacing in that case. Uh, I will get to deinterlacing and some other stuff in the other two examples I'm going to show you here. But I just wanted to start with something that was really simple so you get a sense of the process. So as you might have guessed, uh, the first thing we're going to do here is to go over to DGmpeg deck and start up DG index. And then we're going to open up the VOB files that we've copied over. And you'll notice that it comes up with this file list. That's so that if you missed something, uh, you can easily add it with this add button. Uh, or if you copied over something extra like the underscore zero VOB file, you can delete it by selecting it from the list and hitting the DEL button. Uh, or if for some reason these files are out of order, you can reorganize them using the down and up buttons here. When you have everything in the file list that's a part of the title you want to convert, then you click OK. And you can now go ahead and once again just briefly scrub through the video to make sure everything's on there. And now what you will want to do is go up to the audio menu, select the output method, and select DMUX all tracks. That will extract out the audio data. All right. So uh, also just go ahead and hit F5 for a few seconds to get a nice preview going on here. Uh, again, because this is technically encoded interlaced, it's going to show up as frame type interlaced, 29.97 frames per second. It will, however, show that this is 16 by 9 aspect ratio, which means that it's an anamorphic widescreen DVD. That means that the original content is 16 by 9 aspect ratio, and it's been squeezed to fit within a 4 by 3 aspect ratio frame. We're going to unsqueeze that in a sec here. And in this case, you may notice that the field order is top. That's because I was coming from a high definition interlaced video project, which as far as I've seen is always top field first. All right. When you're done checking everything, go ahead and go to file, save project. And I'm going to call this uh, 29.9p just to be consistent with the other files that I've named in this directory. Again, you can name it whatever you want. You just have to remember what file name you use. Now you'll see that now when you're extracting this, um, you'll also get this listing under audio here. And that tells you what audio tracks are being extracted. In this case, we have one AC3 track, which is Dolby Digital in a two channel setup at 192 kilobits per second. But depending on the DVD that you're working with, you may have multiple audio tracks and you will need to figure out which one of those you want to combine back in with the video when we go over to AVI synth. And as you can see, even though this is a full length documentary program here, uh, it's still going pretty fast because all it's doing is going through and indexing the video and audio data. All right. Okay. When the status says finish, you're good to go. And now 
we're going to create an AVI sense script with the following. Uh, because we're not going to be doing any deinterlacing in this case, I don't need to set up QTGMC. And in fact, I can probably shrink this window down a little bit too. Um, but we're going to need the name of the project file. Which I'm just going to go ahead and paste in here. And again, we're using MPEG2 source for this with a variable in front of that so that you can keep it separate from the audio. All right. Then for the audio, uh, we're going to copy over that file name as well, which again is probably going to be easier to copy paste this than type it in. Uh, one thing I should also mention here is that if you get a non-zero number on this delay part of the name, uh, be very careful because that means that the audio and video are out of sync by that much, or at least DG Index thinks it's out of sync by that much. So there are some ways in which you can correct for that in both AVI Synth and FFmpeg, but that's kind of out of the scope of this tutorial for today. So I, I'll put up something on the blog post relating to that uh, if it's something you need to fix. All right. And then we're going to use the audio dub command to combine the project file and the audio track. Uh, and then, because this is a 16 by 9 aspect ratio DVD, I'm going to use a resize to 1280 by 720. If you wanted to do less than that, you could do like 720 by 4 or 5 or something like that. I like just going straight up to a high definition frame size in this case. And Spline 64 gives me a little extra sharpening. So if I hit F5, all right, in the bottom right hand corner, we can see that this is 1280 by 720, 16 by 9 aspect ratio, 29.97 frames per second, and YV12 color space, which is basically the native color space of DVDs. And if we just start moving through this with the arrow keys, you can rock back and forth and just check and make sure the motion's looking good, and it definitely looks like it is. So uh, that's a pretty simple way to do that. And then obviously when you want to render it out, you can create a batch file and and then using FFmpeg, uh, we can render this out by doing FFmpeg dash I and then the name of your AVI synth script in quotes, then whatever video codec and options you want to use, whatever audio codec and options you want to use, and the name of your output file. So in this case, because I'm going to ProRes, I'm going to do dash C colon V ProRes dash profile colon V3, which will give me ProRes 422HQ, and then dash C colon A PCM underscore S16LE, for uncompressed PCM 16-bit audio. If you're working with a DTS audio file, then you'd want to change this to PCM underscore S24LE because uh, DTS audio from DVDs runs at 20 bits. Okay. Uh, and then finally, the name of your output file in quotes. And as you can see, you can use a path address as well to put it on a different directory or a different drive. In this case, I'm going to the F drive in the temp directory. All right. So we can save that, close it, and double click to run it. And if everything's working, it should begin to encode. Now, I've already rendered this out, so I just wanted to sort of show you the basic process here. Uh, but if you want to take a look at what the end result is, it looks a little something like this. Okay. And as you can see, it looks nice and smooth. Right. Uh, just to compare, I've also gone through and done this using Make MKV. And as you can see, 
looks exactly the same. <laughs> so, pretty cool. So what are the complicating factors though? Um, one of them is if you're working with an interlaced DVD. Using the same DVD that uh, I was using before with that MKV rip that was kind of messed up, why don't I go ahead and run that through DG Index? And you'll notice I put this in a directory called 2997i because this is an interlaced image. Yep. Okay, so once again, looks like everything's included. Looks okay. Make sure that the audio is set to demux all tracks. And if I just hit F5 to preview, everything looks the same. All right, so let's go ahead and save that project file out. And I'm just gonna call this 29.97i. Because again, this is interlaced video, like really interlaced video. <laughs> uh, you'll notice that again, that this has two channel stereo audio. And in this case, it's four by three aspect ratio because this DVD is really, really old. <laughs> Seriously, I shot this project on a Hi8 camera. Those of you youngsters <laughs> who don't know what Hi8 is, go look it up on Wikipedia and you'll see how old this project is. Okay. Um... DG index sometimes will pop up with this field order transition detected dialog. The best that I can tell, this is mainly an issue on some commercial DVDs that might use a different field order from one VOB file to the next. I don't know entirely why that happens, but it can occur. And if that happens, uh, what you do basically is change essentially the project file that DG index generates in order to kind of swap the field order for the subsequent VOB file that has that transition. And I would say that for the most part, you should say no to this. If for whatever reason you, uh, you say no and import your project file into AVI synth and then like at a certain point into the title you'll see that uh, suddenly motion becomes really twitchy like almost every other frame is twitching uh, then you would need to go back in and redo the project file and click yes on this but as I said in general I don't think that you need to do this most of the time so I generally just hit no Okay. All right, uh, so if we open up our AVI synth script, it's like I changed the file name here. That's okay. We'll just call this 29.97i. Right. Assuming I named everything correctly, uh, that should work. You'll also see that I have a crop command in here. That's just to kind of clean up some of the junk that shows up around the outside because this is coming from analog video originally. So just hit F5 and start rolling through it. Take a look and looks good. Nice and smooth. You'll be able to see down in the bottom corner here that I've got this set up to 720 by 540 to correct for the pixel aspect ratio difference between old school two televisions and modern square pixel displays. All right, and it's running at 59.94 frames per second because I'm using QTGMC as is and YV12 color space. All right, when you're happy with that script, go ahead and save it, close it. And you can create, again, the same exact sort of FFmpeg batch file as before. Just make sure to name your API synth script and output file correctly. If we go to the resulting directory and go ahead and play back the resulting video, 
You will see that again, there is no twitching going on in the wings and looks good. All right. So there is still one more uh, type of DVD that you will probably have to deal with. And that's this 24 progressive segmented frames DVD. So um, this is a really interesting sort of hack. Basically, when DVDs encode movies that are running at 24 frames per second, the way that they do this is by displaying the 24 frames per second in a particular pattern so that playback software or a DVD player can cleanly extract 24 progressive frames per second out of interlaced video footage. And in order to deal with that, we're going to have to use something called an inverse telesyny process. And for that, we're going to need some additional plugins from AVI Synth. Specifically, we're going to need to go into the external filters and go to the deinterlacing section and use decomb. Decomb is again a package of plugins that allows you to do a bunch of different stuff. It can do a basic deinterlace, but it also can do something called decimating, which is to remove duplicate frames. And by combining both of those, you get an inverse telesyny. So go ahead and download that package, virus scan it, and you'll see if you open up the archive that it has this decomb.dll file. And as you might have already guessed, that DLL file goes in your AVI Synth plugins directory. Okay. So I've already extracted out the VOB files of the main title of a particular DVD that's encoded in 24 progressive segmented frames. So I'm just going to load up DG index again and browse to the directory with the VOB files, open it up, and go ahead and scrub through this to make sure the entire DVD is there. Yep, looks good. Okay, now when I hit F5, you'll notice that up top here, I'm just gonna pause this, uh, you'll see that, yeah, it's four by three aspect ratio in this case, but the video type is detected as film, the frame structure is frame, and the frame type is progressive with a field order of top. Yeah, so again, the actual content on the DVD is running at 23.976, which is basically 24 uh, frames per second. But unless you do this inverse telesyny, it will play back interlaced as you can see from this 29.97 frames per second frame rate here. So once again, make sure that your audio output method is set to demux all tracks and go ahead and save the project file. And yeah, I'm just gonna leave it as VTS underscore zero one, et cetera. And let it go through and save this. All right. When that's done, close DG index. And let's go ahead and open up our uh, AVI Synth script here. Now again, because we're not doing deinterlacing uh, and we don't, we're not working with any plugins that need multi-threading, uh, I don't have set MT filter mode set up here. However, you will notice that there are these additional little lines here. You'll also notice that I have audio set to wave source. And I figured this is something I should cover in a sec here, but first, let me explain what these additional commands are gonna do. Teleside is 
a command that does a very basic deinterlace. Like specifically, it's just kind of cramming two fields together. Then decimate will go in and remove duplicate frames. However, it doesn't detect the duplicate frames on its own. You have to specify a so-called cycle. And in this case, for NTSC video, the cycle is 5. And by using that, we can get a 23.976 frames per second output. Now, before I preview this, uh, let me just look at this wave source here, all right? So if you decided not to work with Nick Audio, or for some reason Nick Audio is giving you some glitches or something like that, an alternate way to deal with audio is to transcode it using FFmpeg. And the way to do this is if we go in and check out a batch file here, uh, you'll do FFmpeg, then the name of your extracted audio file, which in this case is going to be VTS underscore zero one underscore one, and all of this other stuff, and then the audio codec that we want to transcode this into, which in this case will be dash C colon A PCM underscore S 16 LE. So again, uncompressed PCM audio. And you'll see at the end here that we've got this particular name of 24psf.wave. All right. So that looks pretty good. Let's go ahead and save it, run it. And you will notice that audio converts really, really quickly. So that's a good thing. Go back into our AVI sense script and make sure that everything is named properly. So in this case, so I'm using something different for the D2V project file. I'm just going to copy that over. Uh, but otherwise, it's essentially the same. However, for uh, audio, again, we're going to be using wave source rather than NIC AC3 or DTS or whatever source uh, because we're using a wave file. And wave source is an input method that's uh, built into AVI synth. All right. So once again, telecide is going to deinterlace and decimate is going to remove duplicate frames. Now, you still need to set the field order, however, in order for this to work properly. So in this case, uh, the field order was set to top field first. So we're going to do assume TFF. And with all of that done, we hit F5. Uh, we should see down there in the bottom right hand corner, a frame rate of 23.976 frames per second. And if we start running through this, we'll see that this is running at essentially 24 frames per second. And if we look, go for a place here with a little bit of motion and kind of just rock back and forth, you should be able to tell pretty quickly whether you're getting duplicate frames or not. If you are, then you would need to change the cycle here. And you can find that out on the decom page on the AVI synth wiki, what each of the different cycles do. But for the majority of NTSC film content, uh, cycle equals five should be fine. All right. So we can go ahead and save that, close it when everything is good to go. And once again, <laughs> if we open up our uh, batch file here, the FFmpeg command is exactly the same. Now, um, if for whatever reason you run into a color space issue where it says that essentially uh, you're using a color space that's not supported, which is something that for whatever reason I haven't actually run into recently uh, when using this workaround method. Uh, regardless, if that's the case and you're transcoding from an 8-bit to a 10-bit uh, video file, you need to change the color space from one to the other. In this case, because we're going to ProRes 422HQ, that's going to be dash pix underscore FMT YUV 422P10LE for 10 bit YUV 422 planar color space. And as far as I can tell, this doesn't actually harm anything if you put it in there. 
again, if you're going to a 10-bit YUV422 color space uh, video codec, which is the majority of ProRes codecs, DNxHR, HQX, or similar codecs. If you were to, for some bizarre reason, go to something like 12-bit 444 video, then you need to adjust this command accordingly. And again, that's stuff that's up on the FFmpeg wiki. I'll have a link to it in the blog post. So when you're happy with your file, just go ahead and close it. Double click to run it. And you will see that once again, yeah, so this is the version that I, uh, this is the method that I've just been using. And this is the MKV method. Both work just fine. Okay, so uh, that's pretty much it for today. Uh, if you found this video helpful, then go ahead and give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, then uh, I'd prefer if you left constructive criticism, but if it really cheesed you off, you can, yeah, you can give me a thumbs down if you want. I won't take it personally. But again, constructive criticism is important to me because it helps me make better videos in the future. So I'd much prefer that. If you have a workflow question that's fairly basic, leave it in the comments down below. If you have one that's a bit more advanced, I'd prefer if you left it on the comments for the blog post, uh, which again is going to be up on mesalatthefront.blogspot.com. It's going to be linked to in the video description notes down below. Uh, and that's just so that if somebody else is running into a similar issue, then they can find the blog post via Google search and potentially find an answer to their question. And aside from that, all I can say is that until next time, happy video editing.